Well, good hot morning, everybody. Oh, so glad. The few, the proud, the hearty. Here we go. I made it. Uh, well, the kid and I are getting ready to place bets this morning. Who, how many are going to make it through the, the heat and the smoke? So glad to see everybody here. Very involved, especially our guests. Glad you guys can make it up. And I'm sure I was very excited to have you. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, we're starting our new series, Second Peter. Last week, uh, we kind of did an overview of a little bit. I mean, we, we read through it, so we kind of get all in one chunk. Um, that kind of helps us understand what's going on. Um, so today, we're going to actually get into, into it a little bit more. We're going to get into the introduction of it. You know, it's, it's, it's kind of a dying art with email and everything, but remember back in the old days when you used to write letters <laughs> before email and text and everything? You know, we, we, we write letters, right? And you started off with, you know, dear, or, or maybe I should say go back to your school days and passing love notes, you know, across class. No one ever did that, I know that. Shannon always paid attention in class and worked hard. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we, we write a letter, right? Anyway, dear Bobby, dear Susie, dear Grandma, you know, uh, and you greet the person, you, you say who you're writing it, Two and then, um, <laughs> then you start going into body of why you're in. Hey, Grandma, just wanted to write to say hi. How are you doing? Um, you know, this this is uh, your tenth grandchild, or you know, I've seen a, a our daughter Abby started pen pals with with another uh, village missionary uh, kid that uh, lived down in Arizona. So they write back and forth, and they write, Hi, Annalise, this is Abby. You know, and uh, uh, greetings and. Who, who, and they remind them who, who's writing it, and they say, you know, why they're writing it, you know, it's just to say hi or whatnot, and, and then, then we always end your letter with, you know, well, you know, with greetings or with love, or with hugs and kisses, XO, XO, you know, Bobby, Susie, put your name on it. And that's how we write letters, right? And that's how, how Peter, I mean, that's how these new Testament letters are written too. Do you remember, the, uh, you know, First and Second Peter, a lot of Paul's epistles, these letters. These these are letters being written from someone to someone and for a reason. Um, and Peter is just like that. It was nice is he packs all, all that information into the first couple verses for us, so we know who's writing it, who's he writing it to, and what does he want to remind us of. Um, so we're going to get into that today and look at who who the writer is. Who is this Peter? Who is he writing to? And what does he want for us? In his first couple verses. So if you've got your Bibles, open up to 2 Peter. Uh, if you don't have a Bible, you can grab the Pew Bible in front of you. And it's page 1018 is where we're going to be starting at. In 2 Peter, starting the very first verse of it. But let me pray before we start reading as you flip them. Well, Father... We thank you for today, Lord. We just uh, just praise that we can get together and worship you. We can lift up our prayers to you, and we can dive into your word and study who you are. So, Lord, let your word move in our life, Lord, to impact our, our, our heads and our hearts and our hands, Lord, to change us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, Second Peter, starting in verse 1. Simeon Peter a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So those are the first two verses. And here... I mean, he's going to unpack right away. Who, who is this author? Who's writing it? Well, we have Simeon, Peter. Some, some translations just leave it as Simon, but in the Greek, it is Simeon. Um, and that's his very Hebrew name, you know, Simon. And then Simeon makes it even more Hebrew, even more Jewish. Um, and this is how, how he starts his letter. Simeon, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, let's, 
flip back just a few pages to 1 Peter, how, how does he start that letter? But he just starts it, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. So, so he doesn't have a standard way of starting his letters, and he's adding to it. Now he has two names and two titles that he has for us. His Hebrew name, Simeon, or Simon. Where did, where did he get the name Simon from? His parents. That's what his parents named him. When he was born, he was named Simon. That's where he lived his life before Jesus. Simon is who he was when he first met Jesus as a fisherman. He was Simon. And he's also Peter. Where did Peter come from? That's from Jesus. That's the name Jesus gave him. That's the name that Jesus gave him when, when Simon finally recognized Jesus as the living God. And he recognized that Jesus was the living God. Jesus turned and said to Simon, your name is Peter, which means rock. And it's upon this rock that he was going to build his church. So we have here, we have the whole man is writing to us. Not just Simon, not this Peter, but Simon Peter. The man who, Simon who was kind of a braggart, right? A big mouth. You know, if Jesus ever said anything, he, he always opened his mouth and inserted his foot several times. That's what Simon did. Simon is the one who boasted, Jesus, I will never forsake you. But yet he did it three times. It was Simon who bragged. The Simon who's the one who's the coward that when it came time he ran away. But it's also the man Peter that Jesus forgave. It's the man Peter who, who Jesus, Jesus raised up and transformed into a leader of the church. That's who's writing to us. They have the whole Peter. Both the, the dumb stuff of Simon with the good stuff of Peter. So that's who is writing to us. Now, the more on that is names. He calls himself what? A servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Well, if you're a servant, that I means you're not your ultimate boss anymore. You, you've yielded to another person. I, I'm going to do what they say. I follow their lead. Peter is a servant of Jesus. Now, in serving Jesus, in what, in, in, in what way, you know, think about when did Jesus tell him what to do? And what would Peter be thinking about while he's writing this? Well, after Jesus rose from the grave and he forgave Simon Peter, he gave him these instructions. Feed my sheep, tend my sheep, watch over them, help them, help them grow. And, and even before Simon Peter denied him, Jesus told him to strengthen the brothers. Peter has been given orders to take care of, of the precious flock of Jesus on his behalf. Taking care of the church on Jesus' behalf. You know what that means? Is this son of Peter is writing it to us? He cares about us. He cares about us right now. He cares that, that we're saved, that, that we're kept from danger, that we're kept on the, on the right paths. That's who this servant is. The servant of Jesus who cares for us. But he's also not just a servant, he's an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is a, is a representative. The representative with the authority of Jesus. He, he's a, he's a, a spokesperson, an ambassador. Peter would become in Jesus' name and with Jesus' authority. When Peter speaks, it's like Jesus speaking through him. So when we read this letter, we, 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 can, we can read it and listen to it as it's written by one who loves us, who loves you, who, who cares for you, but as someone who comes in authority. You know, there's some things as a as a new parents that we that Katie and I figured out. They're like, 
if it's uh, supper time and we tell Abby, Abby, go tell the boys to, to wash up and come to dinner. And Abby goes and tells the boys, watch up, come to dinner. The boys really listen to her? No. No, they don't. So instead, we said, Abby, tell the boys that mom says, or that dad says, wash up and get ready for dinner. Now do they listen? About half the time, but you know, they're getting there. Uh, you know, but see, when, when, when Abby's just coming and saying, do this, it's, she, it's like she's speaking on, on her own authority. Then. But when she says, dad says, or mom says, ooh, she's speaking with authority now. And that's what we have here from Peter. He's speaking with Jesus' authority, not just Simon Peter authority, but the authority of Christ is who he's writing this in as. So we don't want to, to kind of cast aside or treat it trivially. It's important. So that's who, who's writing it. A servant who loves us, who cares for us, coming in the authority of Christ. Now, what, what does he want to remind us about? What, who, oh, I say, who, who is he writing to? Well, the rest of verse 1. To those who have obtained a fame of equal standing with ours. Well, what? Obtain an equal faith? You're saying that I'm equal to Peter? The rock upon which the church was built, the leader of the church? You're saying any, any one of us? Yes. Anyone who has, who has come and, and seen the price that Jesus paid for them on the cross and acknowledged their sin before God and knowing that, yes, I deserve God's wrath, but Jesus paid that for me on the cross. To come and accept that in our life and we submit our lives to Christ, and submit ourselves to the Lord, then yes, <laughs> from the newest Christian, you're on equal footing with Peter, and Paul, and John, and James. Keep going. You're on equal footing. That's pretty crazy, isn't it? Is that how it works in the regular world? If you're the new guy in town, you're usually what? The lowest guy in the totem pole, right? That's not how it works in God's kingdom. You, 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 you may be the new guy in town, but guess what? You're right there. Equal value before God. And why can't this be that way? Because it has nothing to do with us. And that's a good thing. It has nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with our merits or what we do. But if we have equal footing, and what does Peter say? A faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus' is life. And his price to cover our sins. That's why we're equal. And that's really the, that's the heart of gospel. The righteousness of Jesus is ours when we acknowledge him as our Savior. And Peter throws another thing I love here when he says, righteousness of God and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus is God. He's not a separate God. Jesus is God. God incarnate come to walk among us, live a life of us, and go to the cross for us. God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know when we come to that faith of equal standing? You know, just as Jesus took Simon, uh, kind of a coward, a braggart, turned him into Peter, or the rock and leader of his church. When we give our lives to Christ, we acknowledge the price that he paid for us on the cross, we get a new name. Child of God. By the Spirit, he wants to transform your life just as he transformed Peter's. So that's who he's writing to. He wants to remind us of that and who we are. All right? And what does he want for us? That's verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Grace and peace. We hear that a lot. Let, let's, let's dissect that a little bit. Grace. The, the kindness that God has for you. The, the goodness in his heart. He wants you to enjoy. 
And remember, not, not because of us, because of Jesus. And he wants us to joy in our, in our life. To, he wants that joy to be multiplied. To live each day more and more aware of the grace in which you stand in Jesus. And when you have an understanding of that grace, from that flows peace. In your day-to-day -day life, a, a contentment, a, a rest, a peace that comes from knowing that I am a child of God. I, I am an heir to the King. I am standing in His grace and always will. He wants it multiplied. Well, how does that grace and peace be multiplied? In the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. In the knowledge, in our brain, in our heart, in our hands, or three aspects of learning. You know, th th does this happen? Um, has anybody ever conducted a scientific experiment? Have they ever, like, put your Bible underneath your pillow and laid on it at night? And then when you wake up, do you know more? Okay, if you, if you take your Bible and you, and you set it out on the coffee table, and maybe you even open it, do you learn more? No. You got to read it. You got to spend time with it. You got to spend time with God. It doesn't happen automatically, not just by thinking about it, but your intimacy with God, as that grows, that's how grace and peace grows. So, in this letter, he's going to teach us about God and knowledge of God. He wants to fortify, strengthen our knowledge of God. So that's what he's saying here in our first three verses. Who is this? This is Simon Peter, the whole person. The before Jesus transformed him, the, the coward, the braggart, the open mouth insert foot Simon, into Peter, the guy transformed him, the leader of his church, who is a servant of Jesus, who loves you and cares for you, but comes as an apostle with speaking on Jesus' behalf. And we're on equal footing before God with him in that. We acknowledge Jesus as our Savior. And he wants us to multiply in our grace and peace through the knowledge of God. That's our first three verses. What I want to do now is I want to hit on one verse because it highlights three themes for this whole letter uh, that we can kind of keep in the back of our mind as we go through this. And that's uh, jumping down to, uh, still in chapter 1, but verse 19. It really encapsulates a lot of what's going on. So chapter 1, verse 19, I'll read it right there. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention. As, as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns, the morning star rises. In your hearts. So you have three great things to come out of here. The first one is darkness. You know, pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place. There's a lot of darkness. There's, there's gloom. There's, and, and Peter feels this great danger coming upon the church. He, he even said, he says he, he, he even knows that he doesn't have much longer to, to, to live. But he sees there's this danger coming against the church, against the flock of Christ. And this darkness is false teaching, lies about God. And they're destructive lies, okay? Um, there's innocent, like, innocent heresies, I'll say, there's times when I've openly said probably heretical and lies about God from the pulpit, but it's been on accident. You know, you just miss, beat, mistake something, it's like, did that really just say that? Um, you know, those were innocent. They didn't mean anything by him, but he's warning us against destructive lies that are purposeful in attacking God and who he is. He wants us to warn us. Be prepared. Know what's going on. And because it deals with darkness, th this letter is not a... Uh, a happy-go-lucky letter. Uh, this isn't going to be an attaboy, pat-on-the-back letter. It's going to be a little uh, 
harder. Um, it's going to be a little harder. Especially as we dive into this. I mean, in today's world with YouTube and, and social media and everything out there, if anyone has an idea, they can get it out there for the world to see. And that leads to a lot of theoretical doctrines. We'll hit a lot of the lies about God out there. And we need to know and be vigilant against them. So that's, that's one theme that we're going to see here in 2 Peter. The next one is the dawn. To pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns. So yes, there might be in darkness and gloom right now, but dawn is coming. Dawn is coming. And what is this dawn we're talking about? Christ's Return. Christ's return. Judging and reckoning as a righteous judge as he makes things right. You know, other books kind of make, you know, we think of Christ's return. We, it's a joyful thing. You know, we're going to be reunited with, with family. Um, but this letter doesn't really focus on that. Jesus is coming back with a sword. He's going to be a judge. So it can be either two ways. We can look forward to it because we know that, that God's wrath for our sin has already landed on Jesus and atoned for our sin. But if you haven't acknowledged that, then that wrath is going to be poured out on you. And if you have acknowledged it, you know, don't, don't be scared by it. We can be encouraged by it. That there will be a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. You know, sometimes we kind of hesitate to call evil for what it is, right? Especially in this PC environment. You can't call things bad. You can't call it evil. We can hesitate there. We can feel weird saying that's evil. That's against God. And hesitate to, to talk about Jesus as judging evil. Well, we, we need to remind ourselves about the extent of evil and, and really the rightness, how good it is for that evil to be called to account. When we look at this judging to come, and we'll hit on this more, but what's great about this, you know, we, we, fo we, we are kind of focusing in on the holy anger of God against evil in this world. But you realize when you focus on the holy anger of God, that highlights the grace of God. Because Jesus didn't first come to judge. Jesus didn't first come with a sword to set all things right. Jesus came to be judged for us. He bore our sins. He faced the wrath of God for us to stand in our place to receive what we deserve. That's the grace of God. That's the dawn coming of Christ coming back. The last theme I want to look at here is the lamp. The lamp. He says here, we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you'll do well to pay attention to as a lamp. So the lamp is the prophetic word. The prophetic word is God's word. It's the scriptures. It's all that the, 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 the prophets in the Old Testament spoke about Jesus and about his second coming and his first coming before he came. Then we have everything that Jesus said in his first coming when he spoke to his disciples, when he spoke to the crowds. Then we have the apostles and what they wrote in their letters. The lamp is the truth we have in God's word. Everything that God has done to speak truth in his word. And how are we to pay attention to this lamp? Like, like a lamp in a dark place. You know, uh, here about last year, uh, the family, we went over to uh, Subway Cave, you know, over by uh, Lassen. It's, just, it's, one of, it's actually a lava tube. You kind of walk in an opening and you walk through and it kind of bends a little bit. It gets narrow, it's a big tube. It'll get narrow and branch off a little bit. Then, but eventually you come out to the other side, right? 
And we went down there as a family, and of course the kiddos were a little nervous. They'd never been down in this dark place. You know, and as you first get into it, and you can see darkness ahead of you, but you, you can turn back and say, okay, there's a light. The light keeps getting smaller and smaller. And what's the only light you have? Hopefully, <laughs> flashlights or a headlamp. That's all you got. That's all you got in this dark, dark place. I can tell you, if you uh, especially looked at our kids when we first got into the darkness of it, you think they're going, ooh, cool. No. That light was right in front of them. And they were focused on that thing. They were, they were watching that light. They weren't budging. They were I'm like, look around. No, Dad. I'm looking right here. I'm like, just, just look right here. No, right here. You know, I had to get them to look around. But that's what God wants for us to pay attention to his word. It's a lamp shining in a dark place. Let's be a kid and be so focused on it. I'm not going to pay attention to the darkness out here. I am focused on the light. The God is revealed right before me because I know right there there is no crevice. I can step there. Okay, there is no stumbling there. There's nothing there. I can keep going because my flashlight is illuminating the light right in front of me. That's what God does in our lives. And that's how we have to pay attention to God's word. That's through a lamp shining in a dark place. So I'm looking forward to really getting into this book. It's going to be so, so good. You see what Peter has for us. As we look at the darkness around us. But the dawn is coming. The hope we have in Christ's coming. If you've surrendered your life to Christ. If not, you be in fear. But also, the rule of God's word in our lives. We can't listen to it. As we come now to our, it's our first Sunday of the month. <laughs> we do communion as a church. It's a good time to, to look at ourselves. You know, co communion, when we, when we remember God, uh, Christ's sacrifice on the cross for us, his broken body, his shed blood for us. It's for those who have professed Jesus as their Savior. Those that know that the wrath of God that should be poured out on us, the state was poured out on the Jesus. And if you've never acknowledged that, hey, this is a good time. This is a good time to stop and do that. Maybe, maybe you've been struggling with something in your life. Maybe you're, you're, you're feeling yourself pulled aside a little bit. Maybe, maybe that, that darkness is starting to look a little appealing. The light is losing its light. This is a good time to get them back on track. To ask God for forgiveness. Let's do it now as we, as we sing a song.